Welcome to 2022, and also a brand new episode of Pottery Visited. Today we are discussing chapter 10 of Philosopher's Stone, Halloween. Or, as we like to call it, feeding Slytherins to trolls. It's a bit awkward discussing Halloween in January, but if you didn't know this, Shay loves Halloween. Everyone knows that I think ha- Halloween is such an important day in the Harry Potter world. There's always some type of shenanigans afoot on Halloween, which is beautiful. <laughs> I will have to share some pictures on our Instagram because she went haul it for Halloween in July during quarantine. It's my Yeah, well, I mean, it was quarantine, right? It was whatever day I wanted it to be, and I wanted it to be Halloween. I did a really good job for my quarantine Halloween. I had, like so many baked goods you know it's whatever day you want it to be <laughs> when the when you don't see anyone and you live alone <laughs> so starting off i think that uh one of the cutest lines we have here is that the castle felt more like home than Privet drive had ever done yeah i think this chapter is a big one for like big things start in this chapter like this is the on page 126 is when harry realizes that Hogwarts is more of a home to him than Privet Drive, and Hogwarts being his home is like a big theme throughout. And then on page 132 is when Hermione becomes their friend formally. So it's a lot of like very important things start in this chapter. Yeah. I was saying that we do really get to see Harry like at ease in this new life. Like he definitely feels more relaxed, like he's joshing with Ron and he's having adventures and he's just, everything's kind of falling into place for him for the first time. It's so very sweet. And heartwarming. <laughs> also, I love the amount of spite Harry has in this chapter. He's just, oh yeah, Draco, look at my broom. Like, I, I appreciate it. Like, the yeah. high schooler in me that, okay, the, the current me that can be petty at times, uh, really respects that. <laughs> yeah. I am, um, I think one of the other points that I don't really think about a lot, but having just reread this chapter again, uh, I was reminded about, like, We know Quirrell is a terrible defense against the Dark Arts teacher. Like, clearly he taught something else before. This is his first year teaching defense against the Dark Arts, and he's terrified of everything. But, like, what made Dumbledore think this man was a good choice for teaching defense against the Dark Arts? He does not have any of the temperament. He is terrified of everything. He's shaky. He's clearly not capable of... He's also sharing his body with... Lord Voldemort, but that's a whole other thing. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't know that. But, like, you want the kids to learn to face danger in defense against the dark arts, and this man is terrified of everything, so he's very much not capable of teaching them that. So, once again, like, why would Dumbledore allow him to have that position? Why Dumbledore? And then also, how pissed off would you be if you're Severus Snape, who's, like, very good at defense against the dark arts, and not afraid of everything that exists, and you've been teaching there for a while, and Dumbledore is like, you know who should teach against defense against the dark arts? That guy, shaking in the corner, crying because he saw a bug. Like, I just, I, I feel bad for Snape. I'm sure Dumbledore had his reasons, because Dumbledore always does, but, like, the poor guy. <laughs> He's like, not only do you not want me to do this, you choose him. Once again, why Dumbledore? It's always his own personal pet projects and like what he has planned for Harry that year that motivates <laughs> the teaching. He doesn't care about the majority of the student body. But again, Coral, bad defense against the Dark Arts teacher, would not have given him that position. I'm not sure how he got that position. <laughs> I just feel like we could have a whole episode on how Dumbledore chooses his employees. Because he definitely does not choose them based on their, like, actual accolades and how they're, how good they are. It's about everything but that, it seems. Out of all of the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, I don't know how he rates, because I feel, still feel like Lockhart's probably on the lower end, because I feel like they learned nothing that year. Barty Crouch Jr. was a pretty good teacher. Yeah, like, considering he wasn't who he said he was, which seems to be a trend... (laughs) <laughs> he did a good job of teaching those children. <laughs> like, Considering he's a Death Eater, he he did teach them stuff. I just feel like the bar's so low for teachers at Hogwarts, so like, the fact that he actually taught them something is just like... You have to limbo to get under it. <laughs> and quite a few of them manage to. <laughs> it's the problem, I think. Yeah, there definitely needs to be some sort of oversight for Dumbledore's hiring practices. Like, I feel bad for, like, Minerva McGonagall as the deputy headmistress. Like, she's second in command, and they probably sit down, you know, they've got their coffees, they're going through applications, and she's like, oh, this person has this many years teaching experience, they worked at the ministry for a while, they've written some papers, I think they'd be an excellent choice to teach the subject. And then Dumbledore's like, you know, I I know this guy, and um, 
He's missing half his face. It got fought off in a battle. He's never taught a day in his life. He hates children. But I think he's probably the one for the job. <laughs> like, oh my god, that's so funny. It's like he loses card games, and every time he loses, he's like, dang, now I have to give another person a job at Hogwarts. Pretty much. So this is the chapter where Harry gets to actually learn about Quidditch. So last chapter we left off where he was, thought he was going to get expelled, but turns out McGonagall's just recruiting him for her Quidditch team. So he gets his new broom, and he meets Wood, who is not a cane, to punish him with, but an actual person. And yet this is kind of Harry's, like, sort of his jock life. So you had, um, where did the idea for Quidditch come from? Good question. Yeah, like, I wonder, I, I guess my first thought on that is, like, from what I know about boarding schools, they do a lot of, like, rugby or, like, field hockey. So maybe it's, like, a combination. It's just, she just, like, I need to invent a sport I do feel like Quidditch was a combination of a couple different mm-hmm. sports. I guess we'll get into that more next chapter, but it definitely seems like it's 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 kind of all over the place. It's like, we'll combine this sport, this sport, and this sport, and then brooms. Yeah, well, I feel like they had to have a sport because that's a big part of boarding schools was, like, ath- athletics because that's, like, competition... And they have a lot of competitions at Hogwarts. They have the House Cup. And then, obviously, there's the Quidditch teams. I feel like sports are a big part of, like, schools in general. Yeah, I feel like by pitting them against each other, people bond more with people that are in their house or on their team. Yeah. Which, again, maybe not the best idea overall, but I can see how it would build more camaraderie amongst each house. So, question is, why did was Harry bought a broomstick? Like, did McGonagall buy the broomstick, like, out of her own funds? Or was it school funds? And, like, was Harry not allowed to buy his own broomstick because he was a first year? Feels like like there was a lot of red tape that got cut through with this. Yeah. So my theory is that Harry probably wouldn't have known how to get his own broom. Like, maybe if he'd picked it up at Diagon Alley. But, like, I don't think he has, like, a Wizard Sears catalog, if that exists. Or Ikea catalog. I don't think, like, he would know how to research brooms or order things and send gleons in the mail, you know? So I feel like it was just quicker to make sure he gets it sooner to just order it for him. But I don't think McGonagall paid for it. Like, I'm sure she could and she would. But I feel like there's probably, like, a school budget for, like, sports equipment or something. You know, like, they've got... Bu- I feel like they went over the budget. Because, I mean, like, if it was a school funds, that's, like, for the school. So I feel like, why did they buy him, like, the most expensive broom? <laughs> Instead of buying, like, a bunch of decent brooms for the whole team? I feel like McGonagall is kind of showing her, her favors in a little bit. She's like... Dumbledore's like, oh, just get him a broom. And she's like, it's like I need, I need to win this year. Oh, I will do just that. Yeah. I mean, she played Quidditch for Gryffindor, so she has, like, she's a homer. <laughs> yeah. We do know that McGonagall is, like, the most level-headed teacher, except when it comes for Quidditch, and that's when we kind of notice her competitive edge come out. I'm okay with it. I mean, I definitely think, I don't think she paid for it out of pocket, but it wouldn't surprise me if, like, Dumbledore's like, yeah, sure, get him a general broom, and she, like, paid the difference to get him a fancy broom. And not even because he's Harry Potter and not because he's an orphan and not because she felt bad for him, but because, gosh darn it, Gryffindor needs to win. She wants that Quidditch cup. Yeah, she wants it. She wants to rub it in Snape's big face. Big, beautiful, pointed face. Oh, yeah, because, like, reading this and when okay, when um, Malfoy finds out it's a broom, like, I don't kind of blame Malfoy for being pissed off because it's just so, like, random. He's like, yeah, I didn't get expelled and also I'm on the Quidditch team. Like, they made a special allowance for me and also the school bought me a broom. What up, jerk? I mean, I love it for the pettiness Harry gets to experience. Yeah. It's totally unfair. It's completely unfair to buy him a broom. I mean, Draco's a brat, and we don't like him, especially early on, but it's just, like, reading it now, I'm just like, yeah, why wouldn't Draco be mad? Like, I'd be mad. I feel like it's unfair that they, she, they bought Harry the broom. I feel like the way around it would have been, we're buying brooms for the Gryffindor Quidditch team, Because some people who are eligible for the team do not have brooms. And have it be like the Gryffindor Seeker broom. So they're not breaking the rules because he's not a first year who has his own broom. It's the team broom. He just happens to be the one that rides it. Like, I think there's loopholes they could have used to make it a little more, like, make sense. But... You know. Yeah, it does kind of play off like it's kind of favoritism. It does, it does. They already spent the rules for him to play because they're not supposed to 
first years aren't supposed to be on house teams, and then also first years aren't allowed to own brooms. I mean, first years aren't not supposed to be on the teams. They just don't make them often because they're yeah. younger and they're smaller and they're less experienced at, you know? So that's not really breaking a rule. But definitely... But they're not allowed to have their own brooms, so... Like, they could have gone about it, like I said, in a much more eloquent way that wasn't blatantly bending the rules. They went about it in the blatant rule-bending way. It's just showcasing the series now. It's just that Harry's gonna get away with a lot of stuff because he's Harry Potter. A little special treatment for little Harry Potter. Despite how much he doesn't like it, it does happen. Yeah, and sometimes he likes it. He pretends not to. But when you get a broom, you're not mad about it, you know? He's not mad about it. I find it interesting how when Wood is introducing Harry to Quidditch and Harry like asks if people die playing Quidditch, how nonchalant he is about hearing that some people have died, not at Hogwarts, but have died, and that like people break their jaws and like disappear for a month or the games could last months. Like he handles that very well. Like, oh, okay. Like, I think I would have more questions. I think I would be concerned. I feel like he did, he did, he's at the point where, like, just things kind of, the way things kind of happen at the school and, like, with magic and stuff, he's like, yeah, that probably makes sense. It doesn't. It doesn't, Harry. He's just not going to question sure, it. why not? The whole point of this game is this one ball tries to knock you off your broom where you could fall to the ground and die. Isn't that fun? I do like how they describe what describes the Weasleys as being, like, human bludgers. Mm-hmm. They kind of are. He's like, Dad, don't worry. Like, we had the Weasley twins. They're basically human bludgers. You'll be fine. I'm sure that comforted Harry. I trust them. I think it's interesting that I think Percy might be the only Weasley not to play on the Gryffindor Quidditch team. I mean, I don't know about Bill. Yeah, that's why I don't know about Bill. The only thing we really know about Bill at Hogwarts was that he was like a prefect and also head boy. I feel like he probably played Quidditch just because... I don't know. Well, I think like they all play Quidditch, but I just don't know if he's on the team. Because I know they all play Quidditch like at the house, like during the summertime. Because I'm pretty sure... Yeah. Um, in one of the books, Bill and Charlie played with them. So I know he, they didn't know how to play Quidditch, obviously. I just don't know if he's on that team. Because we don't really know what Bill's interests were when he was at Hogwarts. Besides, like, the titles he had. We know that he went to Gringotts. So he, he's probably more adventurous than Percy. Yeah, it would just be interesting. It'd be another one of those moments where it shows how different Percy is. But maybe he had other interests. Because, yeah, that, that there's other stuff at Hogwarts besides Quidditch, despite what Harry thinks. Yeah. I mean, he's probably on the Gobstones team. I feel like he was more of like the a- The Gobstones team. You know what I mean? Like something a bit nerdier than the sports team. So, which also kind of plays into it because I'm sure like, because parents come to Quidditch games sometimes. So I bet like it was probably a little easier for Percy to sort of build a bit more resentment towards his family if his parents show up to watch Charlie's Quidditch games and stuff, but they never show up to watch his Gobstones match or his- attendance record award ceremony you know what i mean <laughs> well first he does like quidditch like he watches it and he was even like gambling with his girlfriend in like later books and stuff like it's a big thing to go see them but i just don't think percy ever had any interest in playing like he had other like goals in his mind for his school career that i feel like he didn't have the time because like they had to practice like three times a week like it's a lot of time you're committing to uh quidditch so first he probably he enjoys watching it and stuff but he's like he has other things he needs to do that he cares more about and playing Quidditch. We read this chapter, I forgot how annoying Hermione is, which I think I keep saying when I we're reading this book. And I was like, oh girl, why are you like this? Yep. <laughs> why do you do this? She's just like, she wants Harry and Ron to know that she's upset with them, but they really don't care because she's annoying. But she's just like, you shouldn't do that. You, you shouldn't do that. And then they're like, oh my God, leave us alone. And they're like, she's like, huh, fine. She's just so in everyone's business and annoying and you obviously feel for her because uh, I think it's because this is the chapter where she kind of gets her feelings hurt and stuff and you can definitely, I think anyone can relate to being that far into school and not really having any solid friend groups and it's really hard and you're, and I feel like we know that Hermione has struggles to make friends and connect with kids because she is kind of a bossy boots and she wants it. She kind of, like, tells people, and she, I feel like she thinks she's being helpful, but she's really just being annoying. Mm -hmm. I wonder how Harry and Ron's early interpretation of Hermione affected the other kids. Because kind of early on, Harry's got a bit of popular kid vibes. Everyone's interested in him because he's this historic figure. And then he makes the Quidditch team, and, like, they see him stand up to Draco, and, like... So he's kind of cool early on, and Harry and Ron seem pretty disdainful towards Hermione. So I wonder if a little bit, it's like people who might have taken a chance and like gotten to know Hermione are kind of like, oh, well, Harry Potter doesn't seem to like her. Like, I wonder if it's a little bit of that, and they don't do it on purpose, but. Yeah. I feel like it's still at, there's at this point where there's like the, the cluster at them, they all kind of stick together because it's very early on in the year. So like, 
we do have a lot of references to like them kind of hanging out as a group like they all kind of sit together at the table because they're all first years it's kind of like that those first couple of weeks of college where you're you're kind of hang out with your roommates really closely before you kind of like get used to it because we there is a lot of references to the chapter to like what Seamus and Dean are doing what Neville's doing what Lavender and Pervario are doing like we kind of see them start to like pair off like we see that Dean and Seamus are always together Lavender and Pervario are always together I think Neville always like was friends of Hermione but Neville was never really counted as like Neville kind of feels like everyone's his friend he just kind of he doesn't have like an actual like person or group he's just kind of like there everyone's friends with him so, I don't think Neville has a backbone in his body. Not yet. Poor Neville. Oh, I love Neville. He's so sweet. He's, yeah, he's the most, he's like the Gryffindor that I have the softest spot for. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, out of like the, out of this, this year of students, you know what I mean? Harry's grade. Well, speaking of like Hermione and how she does socially in Gryffindor, I was wondering, would she have done socially better in Ravenclaw with people that may have like understood her intellect and maybe have similar social skills? Or what has that hindered her? That's, I mean, I definitely think Ravenclaws are likely to be a bit more socially awkward, not just because they're bookish nerds, but because they're also like the creative sort of Luna Lovegood style. They're probably a little bit quirkier. So they're probably a little bit more accepting of people who have a bit of social weirdness. So I get that. I think Hermione would have fit in really well with them early on because they probably would be like, no, yeah, it makes sense to follow the rules and not lose house points. And yeah, we also want to try hard in class. So I feel like early on she would, definitely have done better and she would already have a bunch of friends at Ravenclaw especially because she's good in class and I feel like Ravenclaws are gonna be like oh like you're good at this help me out show me how you do it let's study together but I think in the long run Hermione still being deep down a Gryffindor later on like the person she is would have started to have make it harder for her to get along with people in Ravenclaw as those sort of personality traits came out and I think they would continue to come out even if she hadn't have been put in Gryffindor So I feel like it earlier on would have been fine, but as she developed and became more of her own woman, I think it would have been harder for her to be in that house. The way she sort of blossoms with Harry and Ron. I do think being a Gryffindor kind of opened her up more too, because she was exposed to other viewpoints and other personality types. And we know that Hermione was like, she did things for the greater good. So it was more or less to like um, what she should have been learning. Like she learned things that were above her her level but she usually learned them because she was doing things to help Harry and Ron like she learned how to brew Apologies Potion she made those coins for the DA for like to go against like Umbridge like she did those things because she was a Gryffindor and obviously we all know she's very intelligent and maybe that it would have been easier for her to transition to be away from school having people that kind of understood that intelligence and were interested in the same things that she was interested in but in the long run I think it did help her character by having to, like, be with people that she didn't quite click with at the beginning, but she's able to make it work. I also think it's easier for her to find her place in Gryffindor because she does have certain traits that aren't as popular in Gryffindors. So it's really easy for her to fill a role that couldn't really be filled by anyone else. Like, they kind of need a smart person. They need someone to be like, wait, stop, let's have a plan. Let's think this through. There are repercussions. Harry and Ron need that. And I feel like there's probably quite a lot of people in Ravenclaw who think things through. So she wouldn't have found people that needed that so much from her there. Uh, and I think she, Harry and Ron probably would have died really early on if they hadn't have lucked out and got Hermione as a friend. Yeah, it's definitely a Gryffindor thing to like do first, ask questions later. But Hermione in the books is always like, okay, but what if, like what next? Like she's... Harry's thinking of point A, she's thinking of point, like, C or D. She feels a very important need in their lives. Yeah, this is, this is, this is a point I have that drives me nuts. So Quirrell runs into dinner, interrupts everyone's eating, because there's a troll in the dungeon. And Dumbledore says, prefects, take your houses to their dormitories. And every time, I think, because he just wants all the Slytherins to be eaten by trolls, because their, their common room is in the dungeon. He's like, just lead all the Slytherins down to be a nice light snack for the troll. <laughs> he didn't say anything differently. He didn't say, prefix, take your students to their houses, except for Slytherin, please stay here. There was none of that. It was just like, bye. Like, rude. It's rude. <laughs> Stop trying to have us eaten by trolls, Dumbledore. Yeah, where did the Slytherins go? Did they just stay in the Great Hall or did they like work? I wonder if the author had thought that far ahead because do we know 
Is it explicitly sl- say in this book that, the, that there are common rooms in the dungeons? Uh, no, it hasn't yet. So maybe she didn't know where their, their common room was, so she, she wasn't thinking that far ahead, but it is very on point that Dumbledore does not care about what the Slytherins are doing. He just doesn't <laughs> care. He's like, y'all go die. I'm busy. <laughs> oh god. Dumbledore, why? Why? <laughs> doesn't care. Just blatant disregard for the lives of all of those children. Some of who are probably nice kids. We really only get to see a lot of the really big jerk Slytherins, but there's some perfectly nice kids in the Slytherin house, I'm sure of it. I mean, they're also children, so I mean, like... Yeah, there's still a chance they don't turn out awful like their parents. There's still hope. We could have been there. If we were there, he was sending us off to get murdered by a troll. And that offends me. Thanks, Dumbledore. One thing I noticed that wasn't in the films is that they are supposed to be wearing hats as a part of their uniforms, and I love a good witch hat. Yeah, I love the hats. So I was just like, oh, I wish the movies had them. I think they had them wear hats sometimes, but they didn't wear them like... Like in the first movie, I remember Ron leaning there, sad little child Ron, with like the goofy wizard hat sort of hanging over his head. I think they only wore them for special occasions, but in the books, they're supposed to be wearing them like all the time. Yeah. Because Harry puts out Seamus' like on fire feather with his hat, and I was like, oh yeah, hats. Yeah, right, his hat, exactly what I thought when that happened. They got really lax with the wardrobe in later movies. It was a little bit like the directors, like some of the directors were like, wear your uniform how you want and personalize it. I think they like the idea of them being modern and everything, but I feel like it took it out of how magic it was because I feel like it, I liked when they were wearing really wizardy stuff because it made you feel like it was a different world. Yeah. But as they got more modern, as the movies got like further on, I kind of got like, you probably wouldn't be wearing your uniform when you were like hanging out in the common room, but like. I mean, it makes sense to have it in classes and in the hallways and like even at meals. Like, are you going to go to breakfast, go back all the way up to your dormitory, up 600 magical staircases to change, to come back down and go to class? Like, to me, wear your uniform to breakfast. They definitely need more uniforms and hats. I love the hats. They're cute, they're whimsical, they're witchy, they're... Yes, your note here is just more hats, please. Yeah, that's my note. (laughs) I think there should have been a lot more hats. You know, I'm pro-hat. Going back to Hermione, I was saying it's hard not to feel bad for her, despite how, like, abrasive and show-off her character is, especially in this chapter. So I think everyone reading the series, especially me, as Hermione's my favorite character, and reading this when I was younger, it's just, like, you relate to having, to like, struggling to make friends and, like, where you fit in, in, like, groups and in school and everything and in the social setting. Like, even rereading this, it's hard for me because I know Hermione's just, like, annoying and she even irks me. But, like, I just have, like, those memories of, like, early, like, elementary school where you're trying to struggle where you're going to fit in and everything. And you know she's probably doing this out of, like, kind of a coping mechanism like, I, I'm assuming that she has some kind of social anxiety, so it comes out as being a know-it-all and just and she thinks that she's being helpful or she assumes she's being helpful, but it's just coming off as, like, show-offy or, like, aggressive almost. I don't know if Hermione has social anxiety because she seems quite confident in what she says and what she does. Uh, maybe it's social anxiety is not the right word. It's more like she's just inept to read social cues and, like, situations. Yeah. So she is a very confident person, and she's not, like, anxious about that, but I feel like the, she doesn't get that people are annoyed with her or stuff, because she's trying to fit in, obviously. Like, I'm sure she, like, grew up in a town where people got to know her early on, and, like, people knew she was a good student, and she made friends from a young age, and, like, they got used to the kind of person she was and could appreciate her good traits, So she wasn't used to having to reintroduce people to like, yes, I have these traits, but also I have these very attractive, interesting, lovely traits. And so maybe it's like her first time in her life that she had to like completely introduce all of her personality to someone and the facets of her personality that she was most confident in was like her ability to follow rules and her brains and her thoughtfulness and she accidentally pushes those so hard she doesn't let anyone see the other traits because she's still not used to knowing how to introduce different traits about yourself to people so it becomes overpoweringly yeah like it's it's a big it's a big change because you think that she's from a muggle family so she's completely in a whole new element and she's away from her family she's away from school she's with all these people she's never met before and i do think that part of her 
relaying all these facts and reading all these books it's because she wants to fit in so badly that she's like making sure she knows everything but it's also kind of like isolating her from like everyone else poor Hermione I love her so much but she makes things so hard for herself going from Hermione to Snape I was saying Snape does not make it easy being so sketchy all the time so sketchy he has secrets okay he's up to secret things but there's secret good guy things he is doing secret good guy things he is saving lives just forgot how sketchy he was he's just like doing these things and i was like how is that not supposed to be seen as sketchy that's the point it's supposed to be seen as sketchy but he's busy he's saving the world it's exhausting so harry ron obviously realized well harry realizes the good guy harry is that hermione's in the bathroom crying her eyes out when the troll comes in and he's like, oh, we should go, we should, we should go after her. Like, I, he, Harry feels bad, even though it wasn't really Harry's fault. He was just like the bystander. So they go rescue Hermione, lock her in with the troll. Boys can't do anything right. Mm-hmm. Good rescuing, boys. This is why girls go to the bathroom in pairs. Because who knows what will happen to you in the bathroom. Harry Potter is an excellent example of that. You get, get possessed by a diary. You could be murdered by a basilisk. You could be attacked by a troll. So I think the troll is a really good, I think it was also good for Harry and Ron to see that Hermione is not good under pressure. We have Hermione as this like really adept, like they've only ever seen her in class where she's like the first person to get every spell and she knows all these things. And obviously I think it, it kind of like makes them feel bad about their own abilities because they're still learning. And also I feel just boys don't understand emotions at this age. They, they don't understand all these feelings that they have and they take it out. Yeah, so... They see Hermione, despite the fact that she's probably better at magic than the two of them put together at this point in the series. She can't do anything. She's like, she's shocked. She's like overwhelmed. She can't move. Harry's trying to pull her towards the door and she can't, she won't move. She's just like frozen, paralyzed. And this is a very good moment we see in this, in the series that there's different kinds of abilities and intelligence. Like Harry is probably not as good as her ma- magic as Hermione at this point. But Harry is great under pressure. He's able to think clearly. He's like tell, telling Ron, even Ron is able to do stuff. See, this is one of the important, this is, I think, the first time in the series where the directors decided to take an important, smart Ron moment and give it to Hermione. Because in the movies, when Ron and Harry are freaking out trying to figure out how to deal with the troll, Hermione goes swish and flick and reminds Ron that he knows a spell and what how you do the spell. But in the book, Hermione's just busy being afraid and Ron's like, I know this one spell, and does it flawlessly. And it's like, great. It's a beautiful Ron moment. It's the only spell that he can think of. It's kind of an interesting point because this book still kind of, it kind of like flips through perspectives because we get like, generally the books are through Harry's perspective in third person. But in this chapter, it kind of focuses on Ron. And Ron's, like, perspective. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely, I think that's something they do a lot in the movies, to make Hermione seem like the smart one and Ron seem like the goofy one. But Ron does have some really nice, smart moments. I think in the beginning, it wasn't the big Hermione movement happened yet. I think it's more in the third book, the third, third thing that they really, like, focused on giving Hermione, like, better or a lot more moments. But I feel like this was kind of just to be kind of, like, a tongue-in-cheek moment where it's like they had just had that scene where she was teaching Ron how to do the spell properly and then they're like oh and then Ron will actually do the spell and he'll do it correctly and then she'll be kind of like it's like and she helped him do it and it kind of was like more to bond them as friends I guess but I don't know I just it's so it's so rare that Ron is getting his moments but yeah it's just like after the whole series and a whole when you look at the whole movie series it's definitely very jarring how much like Hermione has gotten, especially from just from Ron, like she gets a lot from other characters and stuff to to egg the story along, but it's mostly just giving stuff that's Ron to Hermione to make Hermione look like this like super character. And I think it's a huge flaw because first of all, it takes away some of the fact that Hermione is not good in the moment, which is an important part of her character. They do take away quite a bit of that in the movies, again, to just remind everyone that she's the smart one. But also it takes away from her complexity. She's really, really smart and really, really bad in the moment. And that's what makes her a whole person. But if you give her all of Ron's moments of being really smart in the moment and doing something in a split second to save everyone, you're making Hermione more perfect and that's not believable. And her believability as a character is one of the things that makes her so endearing. And then Ron's complexity of being a goofball and a funny guy and the best friend, but then also having these moments where 
he couldn't do this thing in class, but he can do it when he needs to, and that's when it counts, and that's such an important round thing. Yeah. That it's it's really sad to look at the movies and see that they just decided to simplify the characters into little boxes. Yeah, definitely. I love the, the movie, especially the earlier ones, but those flaws, like, they're really apparent watching the movies back, and I get that I always, I think it's, like, kind of canon that the original screenwriter had, he, his favorite character was Hermione, so he gave Hermione, like, a lot of, like pivotal moments and obviously I think Emma Watson was a very capable actress so they gave her a lot too and honestly Ron's character just suffered in the movies which is sad because Rupert Grint's also a really great actor and he probably could have handled a lot more. Yeah I think Ron's character assassination is the most notable when you look at books and movies of the core three but I think at some point we'll get into the film character assassination of Ginny Weasley at some point because uh, we, t- we talked about that a bit but yeah when we get to- into the films It'll happen. The actress is great. I would like to say up front that I've seen a bunch of interviews with Bonnie Wright, and she is Ginny. Like, she's this smart, outgoing, passionate, educated, like, there's all these causes she stands for. She does directing. She, being herself, is so Ginny. But the way people directed her as Ginny was like, they directed her to just, like, be this nice, cute, sister of the best friend love interest, and not to be Ginny Weasley, this, like, badass. Yeah, I kind of like, didn't know what they were doing with Ginny yet, because... Obviously, they were like they were doing these movies while the books were still coming out, so I feel like they didn't know that Ginny was going to be like this big love interest. So when the sixth book came around, they kind of like they were doing weird stuff. That that's why. But when they do know, they do the worst things. Don't get me started on the shoelace moment because it makes me so mad. Don't oh don't talk don't talk about the Half Blood Prince movie because I'll get mad and I'll like. Go on, like, an hour-long tangent about how I hate that movie. Uh, it was my favorite book! Okay. Yeah. Alright, where are we? Uh, oh, you were talking about the wand and what it reminds you of. Oh, yeah, it's it's just like uh, our COVID test. Yeah. The troll was COVID negative. Yay! Very on brand. Good to- yeah, ooh, mm, I still remember that. My nose remembers the COVID test. It remembers. Okay, I actually, I do have a theory. I have a lot of theories. Welcome to my life. We love theories. But uh, I have a theory about this chapter because Hermione lies to McGonagall and the teachers, right? And she does not have to. Hermione could just easily say, I was in the bathroom. They realized I wasn't with the other Gryffindors and came to check on me. Nobody gets in trouble. She's allowed to use the bathroom when she has to use the bathroom and it is nice of them to go looking for her. That is what she could have said, should have said, would have been fine. And I think she knows that. I think the cunning in Hermione realized that, like, this is a good opportunity to bond, to sort of make friends, to prove herself to them. And so she intentionally throws herself under the bus and lies needlessly just so that she'll look better in their eyes and they'll appreciate her a bit more. And it's very clever and it's, I think, a really good moment And it's nice because I like to see the traits of different houses and different people. And it's definitely like such a Slytherin move. And I love it. Hermione does have a a few Slytherin qualities that you kind of notice in in the books. But I definitely do think that she definitely told a lie. But it was more, it was for Harry and Ron's benefit. It wasn't for her because like like the whole thing could have been solved. Like like, they would have said like, oh, you should have told teacher. But the teachers were all looking for the, the trolls. So they just went to go check on her. Yeah, it could have been handled, like, totally normal. But she felt, like, indebted to them. So she told that them to make them look better and, like, to look good in the teacher's eyes for their benefit. Because, yeah, she felt indebted to them and she knew she knew that, like, she owed them. But I don't feel like they look any better in either situation. She just looks worse. Yeah. You know, because they still go to rescue their friend who isn't there, regardless of why she went. So I, it just seems like the primary, really the only reason for it is sort of to impress them, you know? To be like, I will sacrifice how I am seen in order to help you guys look better. Here I am. Here I'm making a move. She made a play and it was a good one and she did very well and I'm proud of her. <laughs> so you have the, the most Gryffindor line in the entire series highlighted here. Harry did something that was both very brave and very stupid. That's like Harry's catchphrase. That could be the Gryffindor catchphrase. It should be like, 
on hats. Yeah. I feel like that's just like a fandom thing at this point where it's just like, Harry, I'm going to do the thing. And everyone's like, Harry, no, don't do it. And then he does it. Which is most of the series. Yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no impulse control whatsoever. And it's like no forethought. They can't see, no wonder they can't possibly take divination seriously. They can't even see five minutes into the future. (laughs) Like they can they can't see the outcome of attacking a troll in any way, so they certainly won't be seeing the future anytime soon. I have another very important question, because before we find out there's a troll in the dungeon, Harry is eating a jacket potato. And my question is, what do we think a jacket potato is? I'm just thinking this is like a Britishism, so I'm assuming it's like a baked potato, is what I'm imagining it is. That's what I was thinking, like a baked potato. You know, like, stuffed with stuff. Like, the potato is like a jacket because it's- Has the skin in, but yeah, like, a loaded baked potato is what I'm imagining. Yeah, with like broccoli and cheese. Oh, no broccoli, please. With cheese and- Lots of sour cream. Okay. I'm glad we got to the bottom of the number one mystery in the Harry Potter series is, what is a- jacket potato. Yeah, nice to see all like the Britishisms reading the books that I didn't really pick up on when I was a kid. Cause I just kind of like, like I know they call their, their shoes trainers. And as a kid, I never really like, I just kind of assumed like, oh yeah, you kind of like pick up on like what it is. Cause they also have the newer scholastic versions of paperbacks of the books that they got a few years ago. And it's like the Americanized version. Oh no. And like they changed certain words. Gross. Which I don't think that's needed because I have the originals. And so they changed, um, one that I remember is dressing gown to bathrobe. And I just feel like kids could pick that up. They could, and then they'd learn new things. Like, I feel like they really made it overly simple for American kids, which I, I don't get because American kids could get this. Like they changed a lot. I just, I mean, they didn't change the word philosopher to sorcerer. So, I mean, who knows what they thought? Like, I guess kids couldn't get it, but who knows? It's bizarre. But I'm uh, moving on to like our last topic. I think we're going to talk about just Harry, Ron and Hermione and like their friendship and the dynamic and everything. Cause this is the chapter where they officially become the golden trio. I think it's, uh, it's beautiful when they finally become friends. And it's funny that it's just like, and after something like that happens, you can't not be friends. And they're like, they're done. We've completely, in one chapter, we've bridged they do not like each other to they are best friends forever. Yeah. They went through a traumatic event together. Yeah, I, it's definitely trauma bonding. They had, but like, it's almost like they wipe it off so quickly. Like they never really have residual, like so many bad things happen afterwards that it's like, they don't really have time to even deal with that trauma. So it's almost like they're like, woof, that could have been terrible. Good thing it wasn't. Little, little, little. Like just shake it off and they're fine. Uh, but they definitely, I think Hermione. I was wondering, would they have become friends if it wasn't for this dramatic situation? Because it was kind of like the circumstances, because they were happy with Hermione before. They had this kind of awkward thing of Ron and Hermione, him upsetting her. So if it wasn't for this, like, would they have become friends down the line? Or would there just be just kind of like, they were in the same house, they do the same classes together. I like... think they would end up doing other brave and semi-traumatic things together, just based on Harry and Ron's ability to find trouble and Hermione's desire to keep them out of it. I think she would continue to meddle. And I think she would end up in some other terrifying magical situation with them regardless. Not because she needs to be, not intentionally to become friends with them, but because of the personalities the three of them have. Harry and Ron find trouble. They, they're they very good at finding trouble. I was looking in like the future, like you can't really imagine in any of their books, like Hermione not being there. So it's very dependent on like, they needed Hermione to kind of like move forward because they wouldn't have been able to do a lot of things without Hermione. Especially in the first book, so... Yeah, in the first book, there's there's times where they would die and if Hermione wasn't there. And I think that's interesting because it's almost like if Hermione hadn't decided to go cry in the bathroom, Voldemort might have won in the first book. So I guess the moral of this chapter is if you need to go have a cry, you go have yourself a cry. Do you have any closing remarks for this chapter? Dumbledore is a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants Slytherins to die. He needs to stop sending Slytherins off to be eaten by trolls and putting terrible teachers in positions that Snape really, really wants just to make Snape's life more miserable than it already is. And also, they probably should have just bought the Nimbus 2000 as a Quidditch broom for the Gryffindor Quidditch team, and Harry could have just been the player that happens to ride that broom. That's my... Those are my big issues. That and the jacket potato. Love a jacket potato, or should I say baked potato? But um, 
I glad that Hermione has friends now, and it's been a lot more fun to read it now that she'll kind of like cool down her annoying tendencies, and I can start reading her and all her quirks again. And yeah, I'm just like, why Harry just gets ha ha things because he's Harry Potter, and I do love the idea of McGonagall being just this kind of like super stern, strict teacher, but when it comes to Quidditch, all bets are off. Thanks for listening to this episode of Potter Revisited. We will be back next time to discuss chapter 11, Quidditch, with our special guest for the first time ever. Ooh, a guest. Yes. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends. And if you have any thoughts or theories you want to share with us, you can tweet us at Potter Revisited or anywhere across social media. And if you have any theories you'd like us to talk about on the show, you can email us at podrevisitedpodcast at gmail.com, and we will see you next time. Bye!